Hi everyone, team member Mark Sheeran here. Listen, everybody's been asking why we switched to the Skinner peep sites uh, this year. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, the owner of Skinner Sites, Andy Larson, was willing to collaborate with us to build the best ghost site for tracking on the market. And uh, he took our input and really put it into practice. And uh, the, the, the aperture, the ghost ring itself is thinner, so it allows more light in. Uh, it's all steel construction. It's got a lifetime warranty. And, and it's also a very elegant site. So uh, there, there are some other features as well. The, the ghost site itself is dovetailed into the body of the site, which makes it really, really sturdy, and it can't fall out of adjustment. And between that and the fact that it's all steel and, uh, and the peep site is optimized for the tracker and the still hunter, it's an amazing site. So you can go on to bigwoodsbucks.com and get your BWB tracker series peep site today. All right, good luck on the hunt. This is the Big Woods Bucks Podcast. Come explore the big woods and timber in North America with your host, Maine Master Guide and Deer Tracking Expert Hal Blood. Listen to Hal and co-hosts Lee Libby and Joe Cruzy as they unlock the secrets of Big Woods Whitetails. Each episode will provide valuable insights in the tried and true system Hal has used for the last 40 years to scout, locate, and hunt mature Big Woods Bucks. Listen and laugh as the crew discusses Hal's legendary adventures and learn how to apply a lifetime's worth of lessons from the big woods to your own hunting and outdoor adventures. Oh, yeah. We got to, don't we? Because we're going to publish it Monday, too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we yeah. got to start it right off the way the we do. The neat thing is it's not going to get edited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to be careful. Keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Check that out. It's a nest. Yeah. yeah. They're in there too, the babies. <laughs> Why do you think you put right there? Yeah. Lee was there at first, but I warned him. <laughs> See? He knows. He knows because Chris knows because Chris is ta talking to Lee because Chris has to edit out Lee every week we do this or every time we do it. <clears throat> it usually consists of me calling Chris up and going, it was, it was good. It was all good, but there's just, Lee said something that we just got to take care of. <laughs> yeah. We no never bad. have to do that with Peaches over there, though. He's good. He behaves. Really? Yeah. You do. That's good to know. Yeah. At least you behave on the podcast. I know about in the woods. <laughs> I've heard some stories. I'm better than I used to be. <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, Bob, tell us when. Give us the three, two, one. All right. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Big Woods Bucks podcast. I'm your host, Al Blood. Sitting here with me is Joe Cruzy. Hello. Badly Libby. Howdy. And Peaches Rick Labby. Or I should say Rick Peaches Labby. Hello. All right. What are we talking about today? I don't know. we usually do discuss that before. Yeah, we usually have a little discussion about what we want to talk about. So, uh... We don't have to do that today. We can do anything we want. I bet they'll listen. Are you going to tell people that aren't here where we are? Oh, yeah. Good thinking. We are down at Huntstock in farm country of Westminster, Massachusetts at a farm. What's the name of it? Wildwood Farm Come in on. Westminster, Mass. And we're at Huntstock. It's called. It's the first year show down here put on by Patrick Guyette. And, uh, good golf. job, Patrick. Yeah, good job, Pat. Yeah, great yeah, job. job. It's a it's a ton of work. I know I've I've never put an event like this together, but I've done a few snowmobile races. And anyone that does events and you know you put all the work into it and and uh, all the effort that goes into it, and then all it takes is one bad weather day or something like that to ruin it all. So I'm real happy for for Patrick and everyone involved that 
Yeah. It was a real nice I'm, day out here for I'm it. I'm glad that, that Joe opened up the snowmobiling topic. <laughs> that's yeah. a, going that's a start. <laughs> I yeah, mean, you, you put this show on, then you hope you sell enough tickets to pay your bills for you, before you get out of here, right? So hopefully he did. Seemed like a pretty good crowd this weekend. and, and uh, I mean, I, it's just been talking to a lot of the guys today, different booths and from Vermont and New Hampshire and everything, and it's just always a, a great thing to get so many people together with similar interests. We all have the same passions and, and love the outdoors and um, – you know, there's no animosity, no competition, no just everyone getting along and kind of sharing the same interests. So I think it's really cool what, what uh, Patrick's got started here, and hopefully it continues on. Yeah, I think it's good. It's been fun. Everybody seems to be joying themselves, and we got another little bit this afternoon and tomorrow. So if you don't know by now, it's Leon Badley Libby's anniversary one year, and he has to leave to get home to his honey, right? Or he's in trouble. Gals, you know all about that, right? And guys do too. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. It wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't number three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make this one work, yeah. ain't you? I've looked at in the mirror, like, a lot. And I don't know what number four would be like. <laughs> Expensive. Uh, expensive. It, <laughs> it's not going to get any better for you, Lee. No, that's yeah, what I'm it's saying. Gonna be all so, uh, maybe I'll just make this one happy. and just Yeah, on. that's probably yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Since how old are you now, Lee? 138. Yeah. Just Lee, right. Lee, you're 56. I know that because you're nine years younger than me. Why'd you ask? Just wanted everybody to know. <laughs> how old is Chrissy? 106. 36? <laughs> 40. 40. Oh, she's older. Yeah, I get it. All right. I think Not you bad. better stick with it, Lee. <laughs> Make it work. <laughs> then there won't be no hope for you if you don't. Today on Marriage Talk. Yeah. <laughs> What's that guy that does that stuff? That used to All right, be... what are we talking about? All right. Yeah. What do you guys want to talk yeah, about? We're going to do I a like, subject Let's do thing. question and answers. That's good. Yeah, that's good. You want to? Anybody? Anybody got a topic they want to talk about? Any topic. I hope that's I a get great a big, question. Fat yeah. Pension check. Yeah. Lee Doing wants his nothing, pension. But snowmobiling. I don't know. Is Hal still alive in that five years? <laughs> <laughs> Chris has got that Lloyd's of London policy on me. He's trying right, to go ahead and tackle that question. Where do you see it in five years? That's a good question. Yeah. We ask right. ourselves that all the time. Yeah. See. I was showing you where we started from in this. The whole thing started with just an idea. And really, it was Chris's idea. I wrote, I wrote my first book kind of because people, my hunters at camp basically spurred me on and kind of maybe inspired me to write that first book. And uh, I said, yeah, maybe I should, you know. And I didn't, like, again, English weren't my strong subject. But I said, I think I could do that. And uh, I had no idea how to write a book, I mean, how to put it together. So I, this uh, Woods and Waters that produced the first couple, or published the first two, he just, he told me how to do it. You know, I had to make, they call it a synopsis, and you put your thoughts down. And, but anyways, from that is where this started, because that's when Chris, Chris asked me if I wanted to get a camera and, and film. That's back got to remember now, that's back when these outdoor video first started, right? Not, not right at the very beginning, but they were just getting popular and everybody wanted to buy DVDs and all that stuff. So that's where it started, and I really didn't have any idea other than that about maybe we could sell a few DVDs and a few books and whatever. And then the uh, shows, I, I bought my own first year, I sold, did my book. I bought a booth at Maine Sportsman Show, the Vermont Show, went and sold some books. Then I got asked to speak, and it just one thing after another was like that. But for the answer of where do I see it, I never imagined having the team we have now because it wasn't even like... The teams basically started with the guides that guided with me at my, 
at Cedar Ridge when I had my other outfit in business. I knew when I started doing seminars that everybody wasn't going to relate to me because I was younger then, but I'm 6'3", weigh 195, and people would be looking at me and they'd be going, that long-legged bastard can do it, but I don't think I could. So they didn't relate to it. So I said, we got to have some other people to show people. That's what it was about was to, to show everybody that we had somebody that could relate to everybody, you know what I mean? And that's where that went, the team. And that's the team members have changed over the years. People's lives go on. Some people drift out. They had other things going on. They moved away, whatever it is. And then we'd add new team members. And most of those all came from people I knew or maybe one of the other team knew or whatever it was. And I never took that team member on lightly. A lot of thought was put into it, you know. And it was a combination of deer hunting skills, obviously, you know what I mean, and a track record, but also being able to communicate it, because that's important too. So now, you know, we're, we're probably where we want to be. We have, I think, 15 of you now. I think there's 15 team members, and almost everybody was here. I think Joel couldn't make it because his wife and... Eric. Who else? Eric. Eric. And Eric. Eric, right. So, but everybody's pretty much here, which was good. Good to see everybody make it because it's a, this team I got now is a great team. It's, couldn't ask for better. So, this is going to take, I think, Big Woods Bucks to the next level for me is, is what we're working at, you know, I always talk about the system and I've written about it, is just making it so everybody can benefit from the system. We can... We can get the right things that everybody needs, what, you know, what we feel is the best stuff to hunt the way we hunt, whatever, and uh, make that available. Because sometimes I know it's hard, especially nowadays. I mean, just this wool thing we've been going to, it's kind of, it's been a big bear because everybody started getting away from wool, you know, getting away from it. So we're trying to put that back on the map, really, is what it is. And... But a quality, we've put a lot of thought into this. Now that we have full control of all our wool, we didn't have control of it before. Somebody else made it for us. We bought it for them and, and sold it or ordered or whatever. Now we basically have full control because we're buying the wool, we're buying the accessories, and we're just having somebody stitch it. We can have it done how we want it. We can order as many as we want. And so that's going to make it better for everybody, better for us, better for you, better for for everybody and also the information we're putting out you know so but i don't know five years what do you guys think I, you know we've talked about it before and hal's vision has always been one of the reasons he's brought a lot of younger guys along um and gals as hal would say i don't usually use that term gal don't know why it just came out but it's an old man thing but uh anyway <laughs> hal hal has done that purposely because he wants this to carry on even after you know 30 or 40 years when he's not here anymore and uh yeah. right. it, it's hard to imagine that to be honest with you because i know what hal means to big woods and you know he's the fearless leader and i know what what chris dalty means to big woods um whether whether chris has the energy to keep doing it or not but without without chris and hal there's no big woods period right even even with everything that, that, you know, the team we have now and everything we've done, it, it's just talking straight, honest truth. It ain't happening without the two of them. And, uh, you know, the rest of us are, are uh, along for the ride, and everyone contributes and does their part and adds to it for sure. But, but um, you know, it, 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 Hal's vision of, of education and exposing people to our way of life and, and what we do we take for granted sometimes that, you know, we live where we live and, and we, for lack of a better term, we get paid to hunt because we get to guide all the time and everything else. Um, you know, we take it for granted sometimes and, and a lot of it is just sharing it with everyone, people that love the outdoors and want to be out doing it but don't have the opportunity to be able to do it all the time. So, you know, if there's a way for us to carry that on and keep doing it, it would be great. Right, and, and passing it on is what it's all about. Yeah. 
you know, if we can't pass it on, there's no more big woods bucks. There's no more deer hunting down yeah, the road. So Right, but I'm going to disagree with you, Joe, because it's going to be the first time. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's going to carry on whether me and Chris are around or not. It will because you were setting this up so it's the next generation. It's going to carry on. I, I hope you're right, but it's... it's uh, it may not be exactly the same because... Yeah. If it ain't the same people, you might not think it's the same, but the, but the business of Big Woods Bucks will carry on. Right. One, one you thing, might be wiping applesauce off my lips, you know, and lugging. <laughs> I'm going to let Lee do that. Yeah, lugging me, into, lugging me into my stand and or whatever. And it's not going to be your lips. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I want to add is what Hal said about choosing the right people in our team is there, there is no competition with each other and our team. It's no. like we're, we're like one big family group. That's the only way to describe it. And, and, and honestly, for me, that's the best part of it. Oh, it's... You know, the hunting's, the hunting's great in what we do, but, you know, the camaraderie, everyone wants to be part of a team. It's, it's always a great thing when you're growing up, football, sports, but, you know, whatever it is, being part of a team is something special. And as you get older, you really don't get to do that very much unless it's your your work team or whatever exactly so, right so what we have going on i mean that's that's what i'm in it for i just enjoy you know the people that are part of it because everyone is is uh really a plus you know first class people and um it's just a lot of fun you you too lee i meant that about you too well so everybody's wondering why i don't talk a lot on the podcast now you know because they don't shut up. <laughs> the guy asked a simple question. Where are we going to be in five years? That wasn't a simple question. So in 2006, Hal and Chris set down nine guides and basically said to us, here's a platform. It's called Big Woods Bucks. You're all talented. You're all smart. Take it and go. Do what you want. This is an opportunity for you to launch your career. And that's how they presented it to us. Me and Lee Shans, the good Lee, are the last two survivors of that original nine with a lot of pride because we've seen a lot of people no, come Mikey, and go. Mikey Stevens. Oh, Mikey Stevens. Mikey, yeah, yeah. Mikey. That's right. He didn't die. Sorry. <laughs> See, that would have been edited out normally, yeah. but now. <laughs> Jeez. Only you, Lee. All right. So, but I, I talked to the young guys, and there's other guys here at Huntstock. And I see that energy and that fire to maybe be Hal Blood or Rick Labby and to carry that or tradition on. Nobody wants to be me, I can tell you. <laughs> but I honestly think that it's going to get carried on. So you take the Benoits. They had their time. And you still see they're still here. They're still teaching. They're still up here talking about it. They're doing their job to carry this on. And we're going to do our job as long as we can to carry it on. And hopefully those 20, 30, and 40-year-old guys and gals will carry it on so that 100 years from now, they still tell stories about us and the way it used to be done, and they're still doing it that way. But tracking bucks isn't about killing a deer. It's inside. Don't you feel? Because there's days that there's 100 other things that run through your mind other than why my legs hurt? Why my feet hurt? Why am I freezing cold? But something inside of you keeps you going. And that relates to life. Like, no, no matter how hard it gets, you just got to keep on keeping on, right? I didn't know you were such a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote all this down. It's on the back of my hand. You know? But anyways, this sport's going to continue no matter what. As long as we keep fighting the antis, we'll be fine. I see Big Woods in five years right where it is. Yep. I don't see us giving up. I see when Hal loses his mind, probably Rick will hang on to his a little longer, and he can get up here and talk. And then after he's <laughs> gone, my liver will be shot, so it won't be me. But <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe, maybe of some of you guys will be up here. <laughs> but those kids, and I say kids because they're all you know younger than I am, but... They're going to keep doing this. Your kids and your grandkids are just going to listen to somebody else talk about what we're talking about right now. That's it. See, I look at, when I look at Big Woods Bucks, really, it ain't about me. It's about the idea, right? It's the idea, hunting Big Woods Bucks. I didn't 
write the stuff to say, look at me. It's, hey, here it is. This is what goes on. This is how you can do it. Get out there and do it. And that's all it is. It's that idea of that. that I try to say anybody can do trying it. Trying to teach everybody. And that's not, he's not just saying that. So I used to get so mad at how we'd be at the dinner table at Cedar Ridge and some random stranger would knock on the door, come up the stairs and say, hey, Hal, been here in town for three days, haven't found a buck track. Any ideas? And he would send them to where I knew there was a big buck. <laughs> and I'm looking, kicking him under the table going, what are you doing? And he's like, ah, oh, Lib, there's more bucks out there. Don't worry. Always is. If that yeah. guy gets one, he's hooked. And that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Funny you should ask. <laughs> yes, that, that'll come along. Yeah. I got some ideas brewing around in my pea brain here about another book. And I would actually like to do a book on, I'd like to make it humorous. Instead of just being teach, 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 you know, all this stuff. I think we could come up with a few funny things. I think we could things. figure that out. <laughs> yeah. So, so random things. I, I, think it, I think people would enjoy... Because a lot of the funny stuff, the, some things that are funny now weren't necessarily real funny when they happened, but we laugh about them afterwards, right? So I've been thinking on that, yeah, someday. Can we throw the good ones in there, like fire in the lodge and yeah, <laughs> time yeah. you tried to freeze me to death and be and Yeah, you know. we can throw anything in it, yeah. So that'll probably be, that'll come along, probably be a combination of everybody... Yeah, on the team, like, writing what they want to write and trying to put it in some kind of a, not necessarily an order, but sections, you know, or something. Yeah, and then, it'll, it, you know, it'll be a variety. It won't be a, basically a book yeah. by one person. It's going to be yeah. the whole team with all our thoughts, all our stories, all our ideas, all our screw-ups. <laughs> yeah. That'll That's be how, my chapter. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we learn, though. Yeah. Are we going to write this ourselves? Yeah. Because mine is going to say, my name is Lee. <laughs> <laughs> That's a... Lee Lee's trap is going to be on snowmobiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. That, that, got the con that got me thinking again. It's, quite frankly, this last year or so, we've been so focused on trying to get this wool stuff back going again. I mean, we've literally been working on it for a year now, and it's, it's great to see it. It's finally coming to fruition. I know a lot of people have been waiting, and it's not easy to get good stuff like that. And we, I've been adamant when I started. I told Chris when we started, because there'd be people asking if we wanted to promote their stuff or whatever. And I said, I'll never promote anything I don't believe in. You know, I don't care if it's a, a scent or a call or any of that. I just didn't, never wanted to go there. Hey, Hal here. I want to talk a little bit about uh, our partnership with OnX Hunt. Um, I've been using it for a while now, and if anybody knows me, they know I'm not a very techie person, but the OnX app is really, it's a real time saver. I remember the days when we poured over topple maps everywhere we was going to go and stuff, and I don't, uh, I don't do that quite as much anymore. Where it's really helped me is, is uh, scouting, you know, whether it's deer scouting, a moose, or even turkey hunting in the spring, which I do. It, uh, it really helps out. I don't have to spend as much time running around the truck, burning up the gas. I, uh, I'm just basically using my Onyx. Got it on my phone. Don't even carry a GPS anymore. So uh, I just download the areas where I'm going to be hunting, whether it's up north moose hunting. And, and uh, I use it mostly on the uh, satellite imagery. I like to see the, the cuts and the clearings and the turkey hunting, the hidden fields and stuff. But uh, everybody's using it now from the game wardens to, the, to uh, land surveyors and, and uh, just a great tool. And uh, with our partnership with... With uh, Onyx, if you use a code BWB, you're going to receive 20% off on your first premium or elite memberships. And you just go to onyxmaps.com slash hunt. You'll be glad you did. Good luck on the trail. Hey, 
all you listeners out there, here's a great job opportunity for you. Wireless Construction out of Standish, Maine is looking for some new employees. A great two-decade-old company, and they have opportunities in steel fabrication, civil technician, tower technician, tower welders, and fabricators, and outdoor voyages. It's my kind of job. Experience is a plus, but not a requirement, and they have great a, a great benefit package with dental, health, vision, 401k, long and short-term disability, life insurance, paid time off, living expense per diem when applicable, a $300 tool and gear allowance. Geez, I might get a job there by the looks of this. If you have any interest, which I think some of you might, you can contact Darcy Weber at 207-642-5751, or you can email him at employment at WCITowers.com. Hope you get your job. Come on up, Lanny. Ladies and gentlemen, Lanny Benoit. <laughs> and I apologize for being late. You apologize for being Lanny? Don't have to do that. Going to come up for a few minutes? Sure. You can stand there if you want, or you can come up whatever you want. I want to sit down. I'm getting old. Okay. <laughs> come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Sit over there by Rick. He can share his mic with you. Lanny and Rick go way back, too. They used to fight for tracks on the Spencer Road. You got that right. Yeah. Rick built a camp in there, and Lanny kept horning in on him. And a little dovetail up there. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're still there. They keep peeking over. They go, when that Benoit shows up, we're going to unload. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Rick yeah. built a camp in on, in on the, uh, we call it the Spencer, Spencer Road, Road, or they call it the Hard Scrabble Road. <laughs> It's just below the lodge. And uh, you, you, you guys used to camp there first, right? At the beginning of the buses. road. Yeah, they had buses. And we they had buses. And then Rick, I think you bought the first, Rick bought the first lot. There was a subdivision they started in there. And Rick bought the first lot in there, bought two lots really, right? And built a camp in there. And then, uh, then him and Lanny was fighting over tracks on the Spencer Road all the time. Well, I, when, when I was a kid probably 12 years old, I opened up Outdoor Life magazine. I was in, down in Oakland, Maine, down the store, and opened up, and there was Lanny and Larry and Lane and Shane with a big string of bucks hanging up. With a big string of bucks hanging up. And uh, I was hooked right there. And Didn't know you were going to be neighbors after that, didn't huh? Didn't know, yeah. So I, uh, then I run into Lanny one day on Hard Scrubber Road, and I said, hey, you're, you're that Lanny Benoit guy. We talked for a while. He didn't know who I was. Didn't he said some young kid, but he killed a lot of bucks that I was after. <laughs> I did what? I said you killed a lot of bucks I was after in those days. I remember that uh, we shot one up there that you were chasing around and it disappeared. And you told me, "Tell me next time that happens," so I quit looking for him. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> apologize, buddy. Yeah. Apologize. It's all good. But this guy, he was, he, he was persistent, I'm telling you right now. Bad. Bad for the deer herd. Yeah. He screwed up the gene pool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I think you did. <laughs> I can't even imagine what you were like when you were younger. I mean, I know how you go now. When, when I was younger? you were younger? in your 30s, yeah, you must have. Yeah, it, it, it was, you know, a 20-mile 20 20 day was average for me. I'm going to tell younger. you what. When he crossed the road, it looked like Sascot's tracks. It'd be four foot between steps. <laughs> <laughs> it's only three foot now. Yeah. Only three foot now. <laughs> I, I know that step right there. Yeah. Yeah. When you watch Rick walk, it, it looks like he's in fast motion, like you sped up the camera there, and his legs are going like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't really walk that fast, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then I, the first time I met Lanny, because I knew about them, and I, I read his father's book back. I got it in the Outdoor Life Book Club, and I think it was it come out in 1975, right? Your dad's book. 72, I think. What was it? 72 or 3. So when I was a teenager, anyways, I, I got that in the Outdoor Life Book Club. And uh, so I knew about them, and I knew they hunted different places up north, because you went Rangeley, and you went... Rockwood and you hunted Jackman. Remember so we hunted... used to fill up the back of the pickup trucks down Rangeley? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. back when you guys had deer in Maine. Yeah. You remember yeah. that? 
We, we still do. You just got to look for them a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> First time we went to Rangeley, we filled up the back of the truck. I don't know how many. De- they're stacked up like this. Look like we went to a deer farm. Yeah. So the first time I actually met Lanny was, I had sh- actually it was kind of ironically I shot the buck on the cover of my first book, that book that's over there now with the second edition. And uh, I was at the tagging station, the Bishop store in town, and and uh, this older guy came up to me, and he had two sons that were, you know, they were grown. One was probably 18, and one was in his 20s, and he asked me if he. I'd guide him the rest of the week. And I said, no, I, I said, I'm, my wife's up here with me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take her and I don't want to really guide. I was still lobstering at that time. And so he just about begged me. And I said, look, I'll take you, but I'm going to take my wife too. She's going to go hunt and I'll take you with me and you guys can go off and do your thing, and, but I'll take you. <clears throat> so we went out. Probably the next day or the day after, whatever it was, and it we'd had some snow. It was the second week of the season, and it and it started raining that night, and it was raining pretty much. It was it was going fast, and we was parked in on a road, and uh, we'd come out. It was pouring rain, and we'd come out to eat lunch at the truck, and I had a short bed Ram 1500 with a one of them aluminum caps. And me and the two young fellas were sitting in the back, so my wife Deb and the older guy could sit in the front, and they had the truck running to get warm. We're sitting in there freezing, you know, soaking wet, eating our lunch, you know. And I could see, because of the cap, it's all fogged up, the windows, because we're in there. And I can see a vehicle, and the, the road just dead-ended, just beyond us. And I see a vehicle, like a blur, and it stops, and then it goes by... And I knew it would come back out because it was dead end like another half a mile. And it comes back out. When it come back out, I could see it was a white Suburban. And Was that it, Casper? I yeah. Think so. <laughs> and then somebody got out, and they went over to the window of the truck. And my wife was there, and she rolled the window down. And evidently, Lanny asked her where the road, how to get around the mountain. So she just goes, I have no idea. He's, my husband's in the back, so I see him coming around there, and I wasn't quite sure because it was blurry, you know, looking through the fog, and I see that classic, uh, what do you call them, Jones hats, them ones that curl up them? Yep. Yeah. And it was Lanny, and he was pretty thin back then, 19, not that he isn't now, but he was thinner. And, Listen, uh, I got more shape right now than I had back yeah. then. <laughs> You're in better shape? No, more shape. Oh, more shape. <laughs> So he opens up the cap, and he says, where's that, this road? Uh, and, and he's kind of stumbling. I'm like, he's got something on his mind. He, and finally he spits it out. I knew he didn't want to say nothing. My son hit a buck up on the mountain, and we're trying to get down off the end of it. And I go, oh, okay. I said, if you go up here just a little bit, you're going to see a little kind of a skid road going to the right. I said, you can get down through there with that rig, and you'll come out, and you can get around the mountain. Okay, he said, thanks. And he didn't know me from the man in the moon anyway, but off they went. That's the last they seen of them, that, you know, for then. So that was my first time I met Lanny anyways. He didn't say, hi, I'm Lanny, or nothing like that. He just kind of had his hands in his pockets and was trying to be secretive, I think. <laughs> didn't want nobody else to know there was a buck up on the mountain. I'd actually heard him. I heard the shots up there. And I'm like, who in the heck could be up there? Because really nobody hunted high like on the mountain back there. And we were the only ones in there. It was the end of Dead End Road. And then then I figured out, oh, that was them that shot up in there. No, I never did catch up with that because it was raining. So is this this mic working okay? Yeah, I think so. Remember it was pouring that time. Yeah, it it rained the snow right off. It it did. It poured right off there. That snow was gone before the end of the day that day. Yeah, it, that's what happened there. And so we never did get that deer. That deer didn't have a very good rack, but it was a big deer. Yeah. That deer was well over 200. I remember seeing it in clear as day. It was a big buck, but he didn't. He had a scrubby rack on him, which is okay. Because you remember back then, you know, way back uh, when we hunted Maine, nobody scored nothing. All they talked about was what does it weigh after you shot a deer. Right, right. If you remember way back, nothing wrong with scoring. 
But the old timers, they want to know what the deer weighed. Yeah. So I had that in my head, and I instilled that in my son's head. Yeah. But later on, we, we did score a few. Yeah, I always figured the rack was the bonus. If you got a big deer and a big rack, that was a bonus. We, all, we always bonus. just asked, how many points? Yeah, you bonus. Know, you didn't yeah. care the score. How many points? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that Lanny was going to be up here with us, but it actually works out good because everybody's talking about the, how they got to know the Benoits and everything. Well, in 1979, I'd never been in the big woods. I always hunted around Farmington area and farm country where I grew up. But I went to Cocajo. Very first deer I ever shot in my life, I shot a big buck up in Cocajo. I was 13, so that would have been 1979. Then I ended up that year, my brother-in-law, who wasn't my brother-in-law at the time, it was, he wasn't my brother-in-law until probably 20 years later, but he, uh, he had your dad's book, so I read it and I thought, man, those guys are pretty cool, I'd like to do that. I'd shot one and I thought, man, I'd like to do that every year. So then sometime in the 80s, I ran into your dad up there. He was the first one that I ran into. But how you related to me, Lanny, is I remember just about the time that we started Big Woods Box. You remember they used to do a show over in the old Bass Shoe Shop over in Wilton. And that's about the same time that we started Big Woods Box. And so the featured speakers were the Benoits and Big Woods Box. Right, I remember uh, them being over there. Yeah. So I remember, you, might, you probably didn't mean as much to you, Lanny, but you did your seminar before I got up and gave mine, and you and your dad were my heroes. I'd read your book and all of that, but I'd got into the guiding business. Like a lot of people, I hated my regular job so much, I quit and started guiding. So I remember when you got off the stage, you said, and here's Lee Shans from Big Woods Bucks, one of Maine's best deer guides. And I thought to myself, I've arrived. Lanny just <laughs> yeah. called me one of Maine's best deer. So it probably didn't mean as much to you, but that meant a lot to me. Right. Well, listen, getting to know Big Woods Buck people and Hal Blood and all you guys, that means a lot to me too. And I've always looked up to you guys. And, um, and one of my protégés joined your team last year, and uh, I thought that was great. And I gave him his blessing, go for it. And I, I thought it was yeah. great that he did that. That's I always, awesome. Everybody, believe it or not, way back when we first started, I would get people say to me, they would refer to you guys as the competition. I go, wait a minute, there's no competition. I said, deer hunting's not a competition. Listen to me. I did show a bunch of shows down to Essex. You know what I told John LaBerge? We need to get you guys there too so we have a better deer hunting program. Yeah, that's for people right. to come there. There's he no says, "What's well, competition?" I said, "No, it's not. This is for the people coming through the door. We have to have more deer hunters, good deer hunters here, so they have more better seminars, not just us." Yeah, I never looked at it as a competition because everybody should get all the info they want, right, wherever they get it, and then put it to use how they want to put it to use. You don't want to be a clone, you know. You don't want to be me, it'd be painful, you know. <laughs> Probably don't want to be Lanny. You yeah, want to be if you. you. If you're you me, want... you may get a stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess since everyone's sharing all their stories about the first time they met Lanny, I'll share mine. Is he was right over there talking with Timmy Boldick about 30 minutes ago, and I walked over, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I shared a little story with Lanny. I was fortunate enough to meet his dad. Because I was like everyone else back in the early days where I, wa- I read their books and watched all the videos. And at that time, I was living in Florida, but had a camp up in Parlin and just lived for coming up, tracking. And, and every time one of their books or v- videos came out, I'd have it. And uh, in 2006, I just got into shed hunting. And Larry knew one of my friends there that had a, a sporting camp in Parlin. So I had the opportunity to meet meet Larry and spent a couple hours talking and just couldn't get over how down to earth and friendly and nice he was to just, you know, shoot the bull with me for so long. And he started to ask me about sheds and shed hunting and how I was doing. And he told me he, he was always looking for sheds to make knives with. So I was eager to give him a few sheds, you know, just to help Larry Benoit out, you know, and next thing I know, he had gotten my address from my buddy and he sent me a knife that he made out of one of the sheds that I found. So that was pretty special. And I don't use it. It sits on my shelf. 
When did you meet Lanny? I think Essex that first year went Essex? up. Essex? Yeah. That first year, just went up, shook his hand, introduced myself, and I told myself, I'm not going to tell him a stupid hunting story, because <laughs> he's going <laughs> to hear 300 today. <laughs> so, just introduced myself and walked on, but I can remember sitting in a little cabin in the Ziscoff Lake, white out conditions, and that book was on the wall, and I'd get that down, and I'd study that, study that, study that, and read it, and read it again, and read it again, and... and I self-taught tracking the best I could, stumbled onto a few, killed them, and then 2005, I shot a Big Ten in Maine, and I screwed up on a big one in New Hampshire, last day of muzzleloader, the last day of rifle, and I went home, I was so mad, I called Hal that night, and I remember the, the conversation, you don't know me, but my name is Lee Libby, and I can catch one out of every 10 bucks I track, but that last 100 yards is a killer, and it's silent. And Hal says, Jesus, I don't know if I catch one out of every 10 bucks. <laughs> right. Wow. So then he says, I went to the deer clinic, and <clears throat> but between that book and that book, <clears throat> true story, I still read the book that I'm in, you're in, we're all in now. I still read that the week before the season, and I go back to the things that include my weaknesses, which are that last 100 yards. Because anybody that knows me knows I want to make shit happen. That's just my nature. I'm the same and way. And that last 100 yards is like I, w I would rather pull my front teeth out than take 10 minutes to get there. But you just have to. So if I read it over and over and over, it's, it works. Yeah. So put your own personality into it, right? Everybody's got their strengths and weaknesses. You and your brothers were all different, right? You didn't hunt the same way. No. Yeah. No. I relied on, uh, and I shouldn't talk about myself. You guys been doing, doing too much talking about me as it is already. My hat's starting to not fit. But anyways, I relied on my shooting ability more than doing a death creep, as we used to call it. The last hundred yards, death, the death creep. Uh, Shane was actually better... At sneaking up on deer the last 100, 200 yards than I was because he had more patience. A lot of times I'd just bowl in there and, and uh, because I was, uh, I relied on my shooting ability, like I said. Jump him out, give him a, give him a chance, and but, yeah. yeah. The last 100 yards is important. If it takes you a half hour to go over there by them tents for an hour, you'll kill more deer than if you rush over there. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm... My whole life, I've been more like Lanny. I'm, I'm more aggressive than all you guys because I can't slow down. I, I used and, to be super aggressive. Yeah. Way too I'm much I'm the aggressive. same as Lanny. I, I rely more on my shooting ability, which when I was younger didn't always connect. I probably, I always told everybody you couldn't fill two dump trucks with the bucks I missed when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I didn't have down pat was how to throw my gun before the deer jumped out. Never got that right. <laughs> Never. What was it? Twirl my gun. <laughs> you know, or, or try, twirl in your gun. I got it. Yeah. When I was, I've actually learned to slow down more. When I was younger, I was the same way. I just, I just wanted to see one and get a whack at it. But as I, as I learned more and more, I tried them other things and figured out that if I just relaxed a little bit and took a little more time, I'd actually get a better shot than just trying to shoot through the brush or something. Well, you know what? I'm really slow now. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're actually the one that slowed me down, whether you right. know it or not. When you give me that first book of yours, and, and I was still most, you know, 20 miles a day on a deer track, just, I always said, you, the more, and you told me that when I was a kid, the more miles you put on, the better, just never give up. Just daylight till dark. So that was always my theory. Yeah. And then I read Hal's book, and he says, he says to me, he says, you're going about it all wrong, Rick. He says, you need to sit down and eat a sandwich for a half hour and just wait and set your watch by it. And I probably killed, you know, I would say in the numbers of deer I track, I, I probably cut that down to a quarter that I would kill, you know. And sometimes now I'll kill a buck one or two days out takes the fun out of it for me but 
Well, you know what happens after you start doing that? You get really confident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got a question for you, Lanny. <clears throat> I show hunting videos at my deer camp all the time, and people like to watch it, and they like, like to talk about big woods and the Benoits. One of the biggest comments, and one of your first videos when Tom Blaze was filming you guys, you had a hat on that looked like your dog had dragged it around for a week. That was a good luck hat. <laughs> and Well, I'm going to tell you, that makes an impression because everybody thinks that real. They think, look at that friggin' rag he's got on his head, and he still shoots big deer. I guess I don't need to go buy new clothes. I'm good. <laughs> well, what happened was I wore it out doing this in the sun all the time. And through the years, it just wore out for me handling it in the front. And I hate to give that hat up because I'm kind of superstitious about hunting. So I finally had to do it. I had to give it up. But boy. The, the other thing going along with that, because I heard you touch on it the other day, and we haven't talked about it much because he's not in the Northeast now, but don't you think Tom Blaze did a lot to promote deer tracking in the Northeast? Oh, I mean, that absolutely. Guy, that guy was the real deal. The first time I saw him... When he filmed you, because Hal and I have talked about when we drag guys around in the woods guiding, they can almost never stay with you and they can almost never get the buck. And when you shot at that buck running three times across the river and Tom got it all, I thought, man, that guy's got to be a hunter. I got to tell you something about Tom Blaze. When I met him, he showed up and he was a tree stand hunter. And the reason he came hunting with us is because he was interested in how we were doing it. I looked in the back of his truck and had all kinds of tree stands in there. You know what I told him? Just close the tailgate. We're not using those. We're going to go do some real hunting, buddy. Well, that's what I want to learn. And he learned so good. And that guy was an incredible Tom Blaze is a mountain man. Don't matter if his clothes are wet. It don't matter if the, if the river's deep. It don't matter. This guy had stanima. And back then, I was in super good shape. And he'd be behind you, and you wouldn't even know he's behind you. And he was always ready with the camera. This guy, and the only reason that we got some of this great footage was because of Tom Blaze. And him and I just matched up like two peas in a pot. The guy was really good at doing camera work, and he had stanima. And one time he said to me, we're hunting in three feet of snow out in Ontario. I'm leading all day, tracking deer, and boy, it's tough going at 20 below. He said to me, what's your secret so you can have that kind of stanima? Got to drink a twelve pack. I mean, a six pack every night. <laughs> I knew I, I was onto something. I start trying it. I, I was just going to ask where you got the beer. <laughs> <laughs> Get carved up at night, huh? Get your carb. Yeah, you're you're 100 percent right. Tom, Tom Blaze brought track and deer to the forefront. He, he brought he it. He was to good the, at what he did. He took it from the books and articles to visual. Right. Yep. Yeah. And we're very lucky to have Tom Blaze doing that stuff because I had a bunch of camera guys with me afterwards. Halfway through the day, they'd fold. Halfway through, well, you know, you, this is before you guys' time. Way back in the 60s, we were on uh, CBS uh, midtime of the Super Bowl. You guys know that? Probably don't. They had a big article about us deer hunting. And they sent all these people to go deer hunting with us, these super athletes, to go walking in the mountains with us. This is way back in the 60s. Mid, you know, middle of the Super Bowl game when they have intermission, we had a deer hunting thing on there, believe it or not. No this is way back, before a lot of you people remember it. Some of the old guys might. So anyways, they give me this, uh, this guy to go hunting with him. He's got a camera and a battery pack, and we're going to go wander in the mountains. Halfway through the day, couldn't keep up, and I'm not going that fast. I said, what's the matter? Well, the battery pack is so heavy, I'm having a hard time. I said, well, give it to me. So I wrapped it around my waist. Pretty soon, he still can't keep up camera's heavy. I said, well, give me that. <laughs> so I'm lugging the camera, and he still can't keep up. And what it is is, no matter what kind of shape you're in, if you're not used to walking these mountains, there's a big difference between running up and down the road, working out, and running these mountains, and you guys know that. I mean, you can be look like you're not in shape, but you can be compared to a guy that does jogging and working out. So yeah, and Tom Blaze was one of those guys that could go as far as you wanted. Yeah. I notice the, the people that hunt down, even in like the mountains of, you know, Pennsylvania and even, even in the Adirondacks, the woods is opener. Even though it's rugged, there's nothing to step over. Big difference. We usually ain't going 10 yards without stepping over something. You're always stepping over at least logs laying on the ground and then blowdowns. 
and then around stuff. It's the most difficult place to hunt, really. It's just the nature of a forest, you know. And over in western Maine, you know, the northwest and western, is you've got the mountains plus all that crap on the ground, which makes it probably the most difficult hunting places. I got, a, I got another question for you real quick, Lenny, because I tell my clients all the time when I'm up on the Enchanted Road, I take people up there looking for sheds and stuff, and I always point up to... I point up to Granny's cap. Everybody goes looking up there, but it ain't like it's a secret. I always point up to Granny's cap, and I think when I first met you, you told me that was one of your favorite places in the world, and you shot a lot of big bucks. I, I'm not getting that wrong, I hope, because I tell my clients that all the time. Here's what happened in Granny's cap. One year, I'm going to bring this right up. Shane and I hiked out there all the way over to the other road and back again. You know, there's a road that goes around the backside. We came back. And this big buck come from someplace. I don't know where he come from. Big track. We didn't cross it going in, but when we came back out about 4 o'clock, there's this big buck track over there in Granny's Cat. I looked at that, and I said, Shane, we're not going to mess with this today. We're coming back tomorrow because he's chasing does like crazy here. I came back the next morning. That buck fought off all the other bucks. There was a bunch of bucks in there, by the way, but none of them as big as him. Uh, he fought off all the bucks at nighttime because I tracked him around the next day. Chased all night long. Finally, I said, I'm done following this deer. I'm cutting across the top of this thing because following him back and forth up and down the mountain ain't working. I'm going to be wore out, too, because he ran all night. I'm going across the top of that, right on the steep part. I looked down, two does come running by. Lickety split. Well, I stepped up and took my safety off. I said, here he comes. I looked down, and here he comes, and I plugged him. Big old seven-pointer. I can't remember what he weighed, 200-something. But yeah, Granny Cap was a good spot. And not only that, there's only one way to the top of that. Did you know that? You got to go to that end, the western end, and come up through to the top. If you, you ain't climbing it from some sides, you ain't climbing it. No, the, the, the three sides, you ain't going up there. You got to go all the way at that end and come up. It, there's actually rock climbers that, that climb that now. Well, I ain't no rock climber. No, no I know, but, but that's how steep it is, is they use it. It's a... Because you're not going up it otherwise without gear. No. And deer go up there. They go back and forth on that path right there. And I, I apologize for knowing that. I'm just a kid. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. You're making my head swell up now. Isn't it nice to bring back old memories like that? Yeah, it is. I, I wished I was just a kid. I was still in high school, but you told me, like, back in the 80s, that place was crazy with big bucks, but I oh was my gosh. in school you, and couldn't get out of way to right get up on there. that? When I went in there first time, there were so many big buck tracks, it was crazy. I parked my blue Suburban right here one day. Lane and I tracked a big buck all day long, my super son. We come back and he crossed right by my Suburban. All I had to do was sit there. I was so puckered up over that. <laughs> yeah. Thing had a track on him, size of a moose. Walked right by my Suburban, yet we came right back to it. I said, all I had to do was sit here. <laughs> wouldn't have been as much fun, though. No, I wouldn't have. Yeah. All right. Any of you guys got any more questions you'd like answered today? Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for that. So you probably couldn't hear the audience. The uh, guy was a, a question, but it really wasn't a question. He was just he was commenting on the New England hunting and how great it is whether you hunt out of a stand or still hunt a track or whatever. It's, diff it's just different than most other places, that's all. I think that's the point you're trying to make. And uh, the people that don't hunt here don't understand it, because I see them all the time. We have people come from other parts of the country to hunt here, and most of them, quite frankly, that have been coming, we got guys come to the lodge now from out in the Midwest, of Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, the UP, and... They really love it, and they can compare it to out there because that is big woods where they hunt, but uh, hey. it opens a lot of people's eyes to a different kind of hunting. Hal, I got one last thing to say. Go ahead. I'm out in Pennsylvania. They had this great big show going on, broadcast, you know, back and forth. Not a broadcast, but they had all these super hunters from out west, and they're asking them what kind of grain they fed their deer <laughs> and how many deer we had per square mile. When they got to Shane and I, I said, oh, we hunt Maine, we got two or three per square mile, maybe. 
and what we feed them for grain is 180 grain, 30 out six. <laughs> and sometimes I give them a double dose. <laughs> hey, yeah, that's a good one. Take my hat off, you guys. I, I was, uh, I was on vacation back in uh, probably 20 years ago, back when the, the Benoit videos and books put their highlight, and I was really into them. And on vacation, I ran into Chris Hammond, who at the time was a major league pitcher. He played for the Marlins and I think maybe the Yankees or something. But anyway, I meet him, I meet him there randomly. He's in the pool, and we're talking. Well, he's a hunter. So I get right into talking about tracking and how addictive it is, and you got to check it out. So when I got home... I sent him a Benoit book because I thought he'd be interested and I'd really like to get in it. He wrote me back and he said, are you out of your mind? I would never do anything like that. <laughs> I said, it's just not for you then, I guess. But yeah. I've always told people, you either love it, the big woods, you'll love it or you hate it. Yeah. And there's no in between. I've had guys come up for a week's hunt and leave on Wednesday. They just... Yeah, we've could, had them cut out. Oh, yeah. These guys look like they stepped out of men's fitness, and Tuesday night they pack up and they're <laughs> out of there. <laughs> yeah. I just had to add that. To yeah. That, so for all you here that yeah, enjoy it, it you'll, you'll like uh, you're in a different league than most deer hunters. That's all it is, you know. And most, most deer hunters from other places aren't going to relate to it. That's all. Not to say they can't, but it's they don't until they learn about it, and then they'll either make their decision. Hey, I love it. Nope, I hate it. That's it. I, I, will, I will add one last thing, because I've hunted, and I grew up hunting in Maine my entire life. From the time I was probably four years old, I was in the woods, and hunted in Jackman from the time I was in my teens. And uh, then I started hunting out west quite a bit, I don't know, 25 years ago or so. And being a Maine hunter my whole life, I, I never really considered myself a great hunter. I just thought I was average and I could follow a deer track. I knew I was really good at following a deer track. I could stay on him all day. But when I started going hunting out west, I started being really successful. And what I found out is being a Maine hunter, it's easy everywhere else I go. Yeah, and for any other animal. For any animal, it, it yeah. just when I, anywhere but New England, it just seems easy because it's yeah. the game. The game's not as worry; it's more wide open. And we're used to hunting in thick cover, yeah, following tracks and and yeah. you know. Same we, way when I went elk hunting the first time, we went out and and uh, the guides at the ranch, my buddy's ranch, took us all out, and I'm like, I just watched what he did. Because I'd never been around elk at all. Picked it up pretty fast. Picked it up, and I'm like, I'm all set. I'm going on my own after that, you know. It's, it, and it's really not that hard, you know. You learn those tactics or techniques, or you learn the habits of the other animals. But the skill is in your hunting ability. That's where most of it's at. You can adapt your skills to to any kind of an animal but if you can you if you can get idiot. successful at hunting the deer up in <laughs> up in the north woods the big woods I can't go out there and if, everything else is easy just it's easier i don't care what people tell you it it's going to be if they tell you it isn't then they haven't hunted there before all right all right time to wrap it up ain't it thank you lanny yeah, thanks for coming on, Thank Lanny. Let's do it again. Yeah. We'll do How it again. How many want to do it again? Good. Yep. Let's go. We want to thank all Give of you. Give it up for these for, legends. Yeah, we want to thank all of you for showing up and uh, hope you enjoyed what we had to say today. Tell all your friends Monday they can hear it too. And, uh, and, uh, Till then, good luck on the trail. <laughs> Hi everyone, Big Woods team member Mark Sheeran here. Many of you know that I have a passion for helping people solve their addictions permanently. As a matter of fact, me and my team have spent the last 31 years helping more than 20,000 people move on from their addictions. So know this. 
If you or someone you love want to move on from an addiction for good and you don't want to be stuck in a rehab or 12-step meetings or endless therapies, then you might want to learn about the Freedom Model and the St. Jude Retreat. To learn more, give us a call at 888-424-2626. All calls are confidential. Here's that number again, 888-424-2626, or go to SoberForever.net for more information. I really look forward to helping you end your addictions for good. Here's that number one last time, 888-424-2626. Take care. Hey guys, Joe here. Wanted to take a few minutes to talk about Lake Parlin Lodge. We're a uh, four-season lodge located just south of Jackman. We've got cabins, lodge rooms, mini lodge. We're a big snowmobile destination in the winter, full restaurant, bar, all the amenities that you need for your trip. Open all obviously through the summer right on the lake. Kayaks, canoes all included with the cabin. We also do a lot of weddings, so if you're looking for a destination wedding, we can do a wedding up to 200 people. And, uh, of course, we've got our hunting season, moose season, deer season. So check us out. We're at lakeparlinlodge.com. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Till next time, good luck on the trail. 